thanks for joining us as we mark International Women's Day, celebrating the achievements of women around the world. I'm Shuli Ghosh, and for this discussion, we're going to very much focus on uh, the theme of this year's International Women's Day, and that is embrace equity. And it's a hashtag you're going to see a, a lot of, um, embrace equity. What does equity mean? Because we talk a lot about women's equality, and that sounds kind of similar to equity, um, but actually there are fundamental differences. And if I can try and put it really simply, um, equality is about giving everybody across the board the same access to the, the same resources, the same tools, the same opportunities. Equity recognizes that not, not everyone has the same circumstances. So sometimes they need different tools and different opportunities and different resources in order to get the same outcome. And uh, so it's basically a, a balancing of an adjustment of balances because it recognizes that things have to be made fairer. And this is something that affects uh, women in particular because um, there is often gender discrimination built into social structures and political structures. And that's something that uh, can be made a lot worse by external factors things like conflict and climate change and the recent COVID pandemic. Now, removing those gender discrimination from social structures requires political commitment. And it's great that many member states of the United Nations have committed to sustainable development goals, which include uh, removing gender inequalities and empowering women and girls and eradicating uh, hunger. Um, we think they need to move faster and we think there needs to be greater accountability for some of those equipments. And for GAIN and its partners, we know that equity and inclusion makes for stronger food systems. Um, it improves food security and nutrition when it comes to feeding growing populations, um, supporting livelihoods of the millions of people who are involved in employment across those global food supply chains and in making them more sustainability. Though we would like to see more data and more evidence which uh, supports that. Uh, so for this interview, Cruncher, I'm really pleased to be speaking to a panel of amazing women who have broken their own boundaries and have forged careers in environments which are very often male dominated. And we're going to be discussing um, the issue of equity and how gender equity isn't just uh, an ethical or moral imperative. It's actually something that helps whole communities and whole societies. So let me introduce them to you now. We have Dr. Elizabeth Kamani Marugi, uh, a senior research scientist and lead of the Nutrition and Food Systems Unit at the African Population and Health Research Center. She's also on the GAIN Board of Directors. Liz, it's great to have you with us. We have Dr. Jemima Njuki, the Chief of the Economic Empowerment Section at UN Women. We also have Gloria Steele, Chief Operating Officer at CARE, also former Acting Administrator of the US Agency for International Development, USAID. And we have Bhuvana Balasubramanian, India Program Lead and Senior Technical Specialist for GAIN. Ladies, welcome to the discussion. Great to have you with us. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm going to make a presentation about the work that I've been doing. I'm going to talk about the Kenyan urban poor women's ex lived experience with food insecurity during the COVID-19 pandemic. So just briefly about the situation of food insecurity in urban poor settings in Kenya from work that we have been doing. I have, I'm, I'm, a research, I'm a research scientist and I've been doing work amongst the urban poor for the last in Kenya for the last like 20 years and have been uh, doing a lot of work related to nutrition and food security. And from this work, we've identified high levels of food insecurity amongst the urban poor at about 80% and also high levels of malnutrition like uh, children under 50% uh, stunting and women under nutrition at 30%. The situation of, of women vulnerability was exacerbated during the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, this affected the livelihoods of women, which is already vulnerable. They are already vulnerable, but this really became even worse. Uh, I'll, I'll just read this uh, comment from one of the women. The, the situation, the COVID-19 affected her, me because it, 
because I was I, I washed clothes, so I would go looking for work and wouldn't get any because they also feared letting us in because they didn't know where where I was coming from and maybe I had corona and would infect them. That is now the the employers. And if you didn't get a job, you would just have to, to go hungry. So that was a challenge. So many women in these settings actually work uh, as um, uh, in domestic situations. They they do domestic work, and during this COVID nineteen, they were really affected because of uh, because people were fearing that they would get infected. So um, another aspect uh, of women women's vulnerability was amongst the young girls in school. This, during the COVID-19 period, schools were closed, and uh, that is for about a year uh, here in Kenya. And so uh, these people live in uh, very congested, conge congested situations. They, they are vulnerable. They don't have an, enough livelihoods. And during this period, it even wasn't. And these girls, when they came to home, it, their situation became worse. And um, so, so this resulted in vulnerability to teen pregnancies, early marriages, and resultant school dropout. A woman was told us about she, uh, because of the movement restrictions, like there was a restriction from uh, of moving from uh, urban areas to rural areas, and the other way around. Uh, a woman was telling us how she went to rural areas and then she was caught up there because of COVID-19 restrictions and she was not able to come back. She left her uh, teenage girl in the house alone and um, she found eventually when she was able to come back, she found the girl was already pregnant and had, uh, had already uh, gotten married to someone else to someone so really that vulnerability and these were case, were stories that were told by many people in this setting uh, so th there were some coping st uh, strategies that women employed during this period these are coping strategies that are employed during even during non-pandemic non period during non-covid period and because of the vulnerability that we see in these settings. But uh, during this COVID-19, because uh, these things were the, the vulnerability was exacerbated uh, because of uh, low livelihoods and sex for food was, uh, uh, was, was reported as a frequent practice amongst women and also girls. And uh, some, re some respondents even told us that there was even arrangements between a woman and her husband that the woman could do sex for food uh, so that the family can have food to eat. So this community health worker told us, women in this community pra practice prostitution, sex for food. I understand it is not because they want to, be, to, but it is because they are looking for what their children can eat. So anyway, it's understood in that community because of the vulnerability. And there were some um, there were some positive uh, coping strategies that the girl the women uh, initiated during this period, and some of them actually started some uh, some urban farming to feed their families. And uh, when we engaged them, they told us that that was helping them to cope with the situation. And so we have um, we have initiated an initiative called the Zero Hunger Initiative at APHRC. And this initiative is actually meant to contribute to the food system's transformation, to make the food system more nourishing, more equitable, more inclusive, and more um, resilient. And uh, so from this uh, engagement that we did with these communities, we were able to, uh, to start a, a support system through these in interventions to support women and also youth and for economic for to us to feed themselves in dignity, but also to empower them. So we are supporting these uh, women groups and youth groups to, to start, to start uh, urban farming projects, uh, innovative farming, because uh, the space is small, but they are able to do some innovative farming. Like we, one of the groups that we are supporting is a group that uh, is, uh, is supporting girls that have been have been abused, uh, have gone through gender-based violence. Some, many of them have been raped. And so that's a safe place for them. 
And so they, they, they are doing this urban farming to be able to feed these, uh, these girls, but they are also able to feed their families. So really we, have, we are seeing that the, the intervention is having some impact. So in conclusion, uh, I, I, would, I would like to say that uh, the vulnerability of food uh, to food security puts women in urban poor settings at a compromised position for exploitation. And the COVID-19 exacerbated this vulnerability and so interventions that sh uh, should be put in place to alleviate this. Thank you. Liz, thank you very much indeed um, for that presentation. Your, your description, your vivid description of how women were selling themselves in order to feed their families, how difficult is it to change that imbalance of power where women are ending up even exploited by their own husbands? How do you change those perceptions, those gender norms, it must be very difficult. Yes, I think uh, it's very difficult and it's because of the vulnerability, but um, because when we, have, we talk to them, they say it's because of that vulnerability that they, are, they go to that extent. So it means that if they are, they are empowered economically and they are able to feed their families in dignity from other sources, then they don't have to do that. So it's about empowering the women. And, and how far are you hoping to extend your urban farming initiative? How can it be scaled up? Yes, actually, uh, we, we, we have seen it's a, a proof of concept that it's working, uh, at least it's working to start um, helping these uh, women and youth, uh, at least to empower themselves, to feed their families first, feeding their communities and empowering them. And yes, it can be scaled, and we are looking for ways to uh, to scale these uh, interventions. Yes. Elizabeth, thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that. So we're talking about empowerment. Let's then bring in um, our, our, our chief of the economic empowerment section at UN Women um, to talk a little bit about uh, what you're doing, uh, Jemima. Thank you very much, uh, Shirley. And I'm so pleased to be here with you today. I'm going to talk about our work at UN Women and specifically on food systems. Um, as you know, we are one of the UN agencies and with a very specific mandate on gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls. We focus our work on three areas, or we have what is called a triple mandate, uh, working on normative laws, including laws against discrimination based on sex, laws on land, um, and other laws uh, as well. Two, we work on uh, coordinating gender equality work within the UN system so that together we can amplify the work of the system as a, as a whole. And three, we actually run programs around the world with about 70 uh, country offices. Um, I actually come from the food systems background, which is why I'm really excited to be, um, to be here. And what I often say is that women and food systems are in one of the unhappiest marriage that we have ever seen if I may put it that way, uh, because we know to achieve food and nutrition security, we need women's engagement and leadership. And yet over and over again, we see our food systems embedding gender inequalities that make it really difficult for a true transformation um, to happen. You know, just the data is showing us there are currently over 800 million people that are going to bed hungry, and a majority of these are women and, um, and, and girls. There are 126 million more women than men who are suffering from chronic, uh, from chronic hunger. I'm also not in this field by mistake. I grew up in the slopes of Mount Kenya. We have seen uh, the situation really uh, change. My mom, my dad, we worked on five acres of land. That was enough to feed uh, everybody to educate me and my, my siblings, but that land today is no longer enough. As, as Elizabeth has been saying, it is no longer enough because of climate change, because of crisis like uh, the COVID crisis. And at a time when we actually do have a, a cost of living crisis, it is very important that this theme of embracing equality puts women and girls at the center of, of the recovery. Um, so 
Basically, what I'm trying to say is gender inequality is a wicked problem and wicked problems don't always have single bullet uh, solutions. But there is also things that make us optimistic. Um, and I, I have sort of classified these things into, into four and with a couple of examples of how we are addressing them at, um, at, at UN Women. So the first one is ensuring that women have access to resources and technologies. In, and these include climate smart agriculture technologies. It includes digital technologies. The ZIA, the theme of the Commission on the Status of uh, Women is on technology and innovation. And so we are really looking forward to having discussions with member states and other stakeholders on how to close this technology gap. I want to give one example, UN Women, FAO, WFP, and IFAD, we are implementing a joint program on rural women's economic empowerment in six countries. And in countries where we have this program, where we are addressing women's land rights, where we are uh, addressing their access to climate information and climate resilient technologies, we have seen sometimes up to 82% increase in agriculture productivity. And so it is very, very important that we have specific targeting and specific addressing of the barriers that are uh, facing women in terms of their access to, uh, to technologies. The second ingredient that I wanna talk about is women's leadership and agency, because we have seen around the world, women and girls are taking food security, climate and environmental action. But their participation, and their leadership are under-resourced, under-supported, undervalued, and sometimes even not recognized. I'll give you an example. At the UN Food Systems Summit, we launched a report called the Global Food 5050. And this report looks at women's leadership in food systems organizations and actually gain were an important part of this effort because we conceptualized it um, together with, uh, with GAIN, with the International Food Policy Research Institute um, and UN Women. And what we saw from the report that uh, was then launched again, we did the, the study again in 2022, that only 8% of the board chairs of food systems organizations are women from low and middle income countries. And it is not enough that women are just in production and processing of food. They have to be in leadership positions. Their voices and leadership must be felt and must be um, supported. So the situation really needs uh, to change. And the third ingredient I wanna talk about that you, you actually um, highlighted, Shirley and Elizabeth, uh, in, in your conversation, is breaking the social norms that continue to hold women back, including norms that define what women can own. And it's been a very interesting journey for us at UN Women because last year we carried out a study on the gender equality, on, it's called the Gender Equality Attitude Study uh, of 2022. And it was updating findings from an earlier uh, study that was called Are You Ready for Change? Gender Equality Attitudes 2019. Now, the study aims to measure the prevalence of discriminatory attitudes and gender-based stereotypes that perpetuate gender inequality and to demonstrate how widespread these are, but also how they're changing and what can be done to change them. Now, I want to emphasize, because this is so important at this time, but what we found is a surprising 25% of respondents agreeing that in times of food shortages, priority for food should be given to men. 25%. 31% agreeing that when jobs are scarce, men should have more right to a job than women do. So these norms are not just influencing what resources women can or cannot own, but it is influencing whether they can eat or not eat, or who has preference for food when there are shortages. But we also know these norms can change as Elizabeth highlights. 
And at UN Women, we have two major initiatives that are trying to address norms and stereotypes. One is the he for she, engaging men and boys to change these norms, because we know they are a key player in how norms change. And we also have an, uh, an alliance of private sector organizations called the Unstereotype Alliance that uses media and global campaigns to change some of these stereotypes. And this is in addition to really working around norms at the country uh, level. And I'll just mention quickly the fourth ingredient, which is policies, ensuring that we have the policies that engage women and that work for women. So it is not enough for the policies to just engage women. Whatever goes into them must then work for women. We have seen some of those policies around land ownership. The Kenya constitution is a good example that conferred equal inheritance rights um, to both men and women, but it must go alongside addressing some of these norms and actually putting the practical implementation strategies um, for this. So I'll stop there, but just to say recent, recent uh, developments are also showing us that we are losing uh, hard-won gains on gender, in, uh, on gender equality. We are seeing a lot of uh, backlash. We must guide, guard what we have gained jealously but we must also work much harder to make sure that we get to true uh, equality for, um, for men, for women, for boys, um, for girls, and for other gender diverse uh, groups as well. Jemana, I, I mean, some of those figures that you gave us were absolutely uh, eye-opening. Um, I want to pick up on what you were saying about we have to do more. Uh, yeah. Clearly, there's a recognition that having women involved in, in, in food systems and in, in, indeed in other parts of society is beneficial uh, for communities. It, it, we said, I said right at the beginning that UN member states had by and large signed on to achieving sustainable development goals. I know they've been put way back now, yeah. delayed because of, of the pandemic. But are we seeing enough progress from policymakers um, from decision makers, from governments in terms of eradicating some of those uh, inbuilt uh, discriminations and deficiencies that you've been talking about? Um, so what we have seen in the, in the last couple of years, as you say, Shirley, is that we are way off track on all our SDGs, including SDG 5 on, on, on gender equality. And one of the things that happened um, couple of years ago is the Secretary General um, put together the what is called our common agenda. And the idea with our common agenda is to really push member states to accelerate progress around some of the key areas um, where we are lagging behind. So on areas like uh, guaranteeing social protection, um, because uh, I was really um, interested in what Liz was, was presenting, because if during COVID-19, we had social protection measures that protected those vulnerable women. They wouldn't have had to resort to the, uh, you know, those harmful coping strategies that they have. So there is a, a momentum growing around guaranteeing things like social protection. There is a momentum growing around addressing the unpaid care uh, work that women have to bear because that also contributes a lot to their ability to participate in economic, um, in economic activities. But having said that, to also say we are seeing uh, some countries even going, going back on, on gains that have already achieved. We have seen what's been happening in Afghanistan on the rights uh, of women and girls. So we are also, even as we have these um, programs that are accelerating momentum and member states coming together to actually commit to accelerate momentum, we are also concerned about areas where um, we are seeing some of those hard, hard won gains uh, going going back backtracking yeah, yeah. That, yeah. That, that's very true Jemima thank you very much indeed for that um, let me bring in Gloria because I know that empowering women and girls is one of the core mandates of care tell me uh, a bit about what you're doing thank you thank you very much Julie and uh, 
And it's amazing to be with uh, women leaders like everyone in this room today. I'd like to thank Gain for inviting me to participate in a discussion of a topic that is near and dear to my heart, food security, which is how I started my career, uh, and gender. Um, this year's theme for international development, uh, Women's Day is Embrace Gender Equality is an important topic that I'm also very happy to participate in. Uh, CARE puts women and girls at the center of our programs because we know that empowering women leads to broader social and economic growth. And borrowing some statements that were shared with the panel, when women are empowered, they are more likely to invest in the health and education of their families, and empowered women play a critical role in creating more stable communities. Uh, we know that women play a, a crucial role in the production of food and in feeding their families. We know this from our own studies and that there's a high and strong correlation between gender equality and food security, including especially the nutritional status of families. At the same time, however, in 2022, an FAO report showed that over time, from 2014 to 2021, women have experienced greater food insecurity than men. And sadly, this gap keeps growing. As of 2021, we estimate that there, have, there are as many as 150 million more women who are food insecure than men in the world. And this is an extremely large number, bigger than the population of many countries around the world. We believe that uh, centering women and girls increases the number of vulnerable and disadvantaged people that we are able to reach. It also accelerates the impacts that we are able to achieve, whether on food security, health, the economy, etc. And it makes those impacts more durable, and it improves families and communities' resilience. Our focus on women and girls is an integral part of CARE's gender transformative approach. This is an approach that we have been applying to many of our programs. We believe that by adopting and implementing a gender transformative approach, we address the causes of gender inequality, which by and large are rooted in inequities in social structures and institutions. Through our gender transformative approach, we address gender-related inequities in power dynamics, in gender-blind and often inequitable legislative and policy frameworks, and in rigid and harmful gender norms and rules. We talked earlier about gender norms that prevent women from having access to resources, for example. Through this approach, we aspire to achieve a lasting change in power dynamics and women's choices over their lives. In short, through a gender transformative approach, we can help to achieve gender equalities by addressing inherent gender inequities, uh, which I think is very important and which is why I'm really, really interested in the focus on uh, gender equity. What the gender transformative approach, transformative approach is not is addressing symptoms or outcomes of factors. Um, it is not about creating temporary increases or improvements in opportunities. We support our country teams to put women and girls in the center by designing, <clears throat> implementing, and scaling proven approaches that work to address structural inequities which result in or exacerbate gender inequalities. We provide thought leadership to influence internal and external programming. Uh, we provide training and other forms of technical assistance to reinforce the adoption and implementation of proven gender transformative approaches. In slide five, I provide three examples of our gender transformative programs in action in Rwanda, Burundi, Bangladesh, and Nepal. Through deeper engagement and use of participatory approaches, in these and other cases, CARE has achieved more sustained positive changes in addressing gender inequalities and the structural issues that drive gender inequities. And we have observed greater cost effectiveness and higher impacts, as well as higher returns on our investments in these programs. Let me end by saying that the gender transformative actions are key to making truly sustainable changes in addressing gender inequalities. 
However, addressing gender inequalities require gaining a deeper understanding of the inequitable social structures and institutions that result in the inequality in the first place. The problem is that we do not have enough data to gain this deeper understanding. There is a lot of data on gender and a lot of data on food security. Surprisingly, there is little overlap between the two. It is getting better, but it's still a long way to go. Uh, in our most recent review of policy responses to the global hunger crisis, for example, of 86 policies and plans designed to address food insecurity, which were published in 2022, 26% overlooked women entirely. And almost half did not mention gender inequality or gender inequity. Over 50% of the global reports, policies, response plans, and funding documents do not have any, have any form of sex disaggregated data on food security. So let me end by saying that if we are going to achieve gender equality, we need to work toward achieving gender equity. Commitment to gender equity requires a disciplined commitment to addressing the data gaps needed to resolve gender inequities caused by existing gender norms, structures, and institutions. So let me end there. And I think um, there's a lot of work to be done, surely, but, uh, and there's a lot of work in understanding more deeply how we can address the gender equity inequities. Gloria, thank you. thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that. I want to go back to your uh, point about the win-win that you had on that, that slide there, the fact that investing in gender transformation approaches is cost-effective uh, mm -hmm. and you get a massive return on investment because I, I think often money and economy um, make the point more strongly than, than other arguments. Is that a message that's getting through? Oh, well, not enough. And I think we need to make that. I think every donor, everyone wants to be able to see that there are returns, that they are, we are making impact. And I think one of the ways that we uh, can communicate effectively through some of the donors is translating the impact in how does this increase incomes? How does how do increased incomes relate to the investments that you made? In other words, the return on investments. So we need to do better, do a better job of that, um, but we're getting there. Excellent. Gloria, for the moment, thank you very much indeed for that. And uh, last but definitely not least, let me bring in uh, Bhuvana. Um, tell us about Gaines' work in India. Thank you, Shirley. And uh, it's such a privilege to be here and a privilege to go last because you get to be inspired by the fellow speakers. How do you embrace equity when it comes to food systems? And I'll take a minute to look at what is a food system. We talk about um, it's it's some, basically, you know, to put it short, it's farm to fork. And when you look at the key factors or, or the key brackets, it's food supply chain, which is production, storage, distribution, processing, packaging, marketing. It's the food environments in terms of availability, affordability, quality, safety, vendor properties and food messaging, labeling and marketing. Individual factors that affect access to food, which includes economic, cognitive, aspirational and situational factors consumer behavior that informs procurement or buying of food, preparation of food and consumption of food, which affects our diet in terms of nutrition and health outcomes and other larger impacts, such as the socioeconomic impact and the environmental impact. And there are a several cross-cutting external drivers, such as climate change, globalization, um, income growth, urbanization, you know, population growth and migration, political leadership and governance, social and context, uh, cultural context. In a diverse food system, so the, the reality is that gendered experience of the food system's value chain and its external drivers is a reality that often negatively impacts women and leaves them in the sidelines of decision making if each of the value chain doesn't become gender intentional. Having this context in mind, what does gender equity mean to us at GAIN? There is enough evidence to show that gender intentionality in food systems approach makes better sense 
in terms of nutrition and food security, uh, for having an equitable, just, and a resilient food systems. And it also simply makes business sense. Investing in women workforce or in women across the value chain, be it farm workers to consumers, it makes better business sense for everybody who's investing at across the value chain. Women are an integral, but often an invisible part of the food system value chain. And despite affecting them significantly, they are not center stage and often sideline their voices are not actively involved in shaping how food systems uh, value chains work. How does GAIN, what does GAIN do in terms of its programs to make it gender intentional? Uh, we have increasingly focusing on how do we as an organization work towards uh, a program management life cycle that is very gender intentional in its approach, be it across our programs, right from design implementation, the learnings that we get from it through our monitoring and evaluation exercises, and how does this influence policy governance and driving impact at scale. By this for instance, if I have to draw uh, from our experiences of implementing programs across Asia and Africa, you know, for instance, we work with self-help groups in India for scaling up market linkages for biofortified crops. We work with self-help groups in Bihar and India to support scaling up of fortified rations as, as part of the safety net programs for pregnant women and children. We provide financial support through our nutritious food financing uh, facility for women in sub-Saharan African countries. Our workforce nutrition program one of the key pillars under our Workforce Nutrition Alliance is to provide support for new mothers through breastfeeding facilities. So a lot of our programs have that gender lens to ensure that we have the gender voice included in our program to really do justice and ensure better and healthier diets for all, leaving no one behind. But truly the revolution begins at home. For us, again, the culture focuses on equity, diversity, and inclusion. And for that, we rely heavily on data. We have a strong EDI team that collects and analyzes data on a periodic basis and has these demographics analyzed and, and reported on, which informs us who are we as, as GAIN colleagues? You know, how many of us in the board, how many of us in the staff are women, men, and, and people across different ages, ethnicities, religions, countries? And what is our, our growth trajectory in terms of learning and development and employment opportunities within GAIN? What is our pay gap? Is there a pay gap? Can we, do, you know, how do we re reduce that pay gap within GAIN? And, and I, I had to do a bit of research and I'm pretty glad I did that for, for this discussion today to, to say that, you know, the top one fourth percent uh, quartile of, of colleagues in GAIN, 69% of them are women uh, in terms of the top one fourth quartile uh, uh, in leadership roles as well, which is, which is fantastic. And it makes me so happy to report that here. Uh, apart from that, I think a personal motto for me as somebody, you know, working with GAIN and as a woman uh, in a workspace is to be an ally. And what do we mean by being an ally? You know, listening to all, all our, uh, you know, fellow speakers here, uh, it really made me think we've had, we've been uh, sidelined for generations and we've had our realities carved through our own personal and generational experiences as women. And as a result of that, we have some truly innovative and resilient learning that we've done through our coping mechanisms. And I am sure all of you can relate to that, especially in the workspace. We, we are resilient in terms of our solutions. And it's, and it's interesting and fascinating. What can we do as, as women, uh, as, as people managers? We can listen to those stories. We can create safe, enabling spaces for women to truly nurture their true potential and grow, create opportunities for cross-learning and for paying it forward as we grow further. And that's that's a personal motto for me, being an ally for, for every woman. I'll stop here. 
Bravana, that that's I think that message um, will probably touch a, a lot of us um, that sometimes women are women's best allies. Can I ask you um, the importance then of, of female leaders and that depends on getting more female leaders in, into those roles, but female leaders supporting and mentoring those in the organization below them. How important is that? Oh, it's absolutely important in terms of having a seat at the table where decisions are made, especially in a, in a, in a workspace like ours, you know, food systems. Food is something that's so integral to a woman's life because there is the saying, you know, give a man a fish, he would feed him for a day. Teach him to fish, he would feed himself for his lifetime. But teach a woman to fish, she will feed her family for a lifetime. So, yeah, that's the kind of uh, relationship that women have with food. And bringing food to the table, bringing food to children is an extremely emotional and personal experience for women. So food systems is empty without women in that conversation across that value chain. And, and as leaders, if I could just add, and as leaders, I think it is imperative for us to ensure that there are women's voices heard at every stage, in every uh, workspace, in every profile across the food systems and health and nutrition, be it any sector, I think there are women's voices that need to be heard. Uh, and I think you've just hit the nail on the head there. That's exactly what I was going to come on to uh, and, uh, and, and have a wider discussion with all of you about how we get more women into positions where their voices are heard and who should be involved with that. Um, Jemima, I know that you might have to leave us shortly. So um, let me come to you uh, first. I, you know, particularly with food systems, but I think this goes for, for all industries. How do organisations become more inclusive, more supportive in making sure that, that women can succeed and that we have women not just doing the production and doing the harvesting, but actually at decision-making level? Thanks, uh, Shuli, for that question. So the, this is multifaceted. Um, first, we know we don't have enough women's leadership and representation in, in food systems across the whole spectrum. And what we know we must do, and we have done this in politics, right? That across the world, in politics, we are putting quarters and laws that actually support those quarters for women's leadership. The other day, we saw a good example from Sierra Leone, where they said um, women there must be at least a third. It's still not ideal. We want at least 50%, but at least mm -hmm. a third of women in leadership, not just across government, but across private sector and mm -hmm. other sectors as well. And that becomes a first point to then say, there is a law, there is a legislation that actually compels everyone because it's very easy for us to keep talking amongst ourselves about how women's leadership is important, right? And sometimes we are actually always talking to the converted. I'm sure even here, we all believe that to be important. But that first step of legislation is really, really critical, right? So we start yet, with legislation and we we'll need, build on yes, that. And then build on that. But to build on that, that's where we have to address the structural barriers, because quarters are a first point. How do we then address the structural barriers that stop women from being in those spaces? Some of those have to do with internal policies. How inclusive are the food systems organizations of, on, of women? What are the policies they have about parental leave? What are the policies that they have about sexual harassment in the world mm -hmm. of work? So let, all let these in, things. Let me bring in Gloria because I can see yeah. Gloria nodding and uh, Gloria one of the things you said in your presentation was it was really important to get men and boys involved uh, as right. well. So uh, Jemima makes the point how do you change those policies which um, make it more difficult for women? How do we do that? 
Well, I think by knowing which policies will make it inclusive and inclusive for women uh, in an organization writ large, including organizations that are involved in agriculture and food systems, um, women leaders or leaders in general should make sure that there is a pipeline of women to access key growth positions in the organizations. Um, say 50% of candidates for a certain position should be women. Uh, Jemima talked about uh, parental policies. Uh, there should be longer leave periods for men uh, so that they take off uh, during um, the, the, they have a longer paternity leave. And it's not just a woman that's been totally taken out of, of uh, the workplace when, and when she gives birth. Um, and of course, looking at family-friendly uh, policies within organizations are very important. And they are one of those that truly discriminate against women who have children and family to raise. And, and then being conscious about uh, unconscious biases that are gender related. I think that's really important. And making sure that um, training and other resources are available. And we can start from the beginning. STEM is not as a gender uh, related, to, you know, it's related to men, to boys. We should make it be known that uh, STEM is just as important and as uh, important for girls and accessible to girls. So it, it's a whole range of things that we could do uh, in order to make the workplace more inclusive and uh, more equitable for women uh, as workers and as leaders. Yeah, it was mentioned um, that access to digital tools um, actually make women uh, much more productive in, in the agricultural sphere. Um, Elizabeth, let me come to you because I know that you've advised governments in Kenya. So uh, when it comes to designing better policies and programs to support women's involvement in food systems, uh, is that gaining traction? In the past, I've been more involved in, uh, in, in uh, breastfeeding and nutrition work. And it's from that perspective I realized, I mean, I learned a lot that food security is very important for us to be able to optimize breastfeeding and early nutrition for children. So uh, I have entered in this space of supporting women in agriculture in the, in the recent past. So um, I, I have not really uh, been involved in the, like uh, uh, informing the police, the, like the laws or policies in the, in the food system yet, but um, the work we are doing is very important in informing those policies. And uh, like uh, in Nairobi, for example, we have this uh, policy of, uh, of promoting, uh, promoting and regulating urban agriculture, which is a good policy that would support women to be involved uh, be, uh, in agriculture and in um, urban farming for for, to feed themselves, but also to feed their families and to, uh, for economic gain. So if that can, we can be able to inform that actually eventually this is working, it can inform other like counties in, um, in Kenya, but also be, uh, beyond K Kenya in Africa that we can promote even women who are in urban areas to be able to, to participate in urban, in farming and supporting themselves. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to give the last quick thought to uh, Bhavana because uh, we are coming to the end of the discussion. And it, it's, a, it's a very simple question, Bhavana. Where do you want to see food systems um, a few years from now? Here we are on International Women's Day. What needs to change about food systems? Food systems in itself is very complex, right? And it, for it to change, there are so many moving parts that need to line, align itself and be available to feed into each other and to inform each other so that you grow healthier foods that is available for people to eat, for all people, especially vulnerable, and that includes women and children. So what needs to change is inclusion of vulnerable voices in the decision-making, in the implementation, and most of all in resource availability. And by that, I mean, in terms of financing. There needs to be money put in to include vulnerable voices. For instance, the Bill and Melinda Gates has, you know, Women Lift Health, which is a, a, a program that 
grooms managers, women managers, mentors them by pairing them with leaders in that space so that there is more women in leadership roles to make decisions and include women's voices. And that's something we need. There's There needs to be limelight. There needs to be a spotlight focus on gender and on vulnerable voices so that it's more equitable and just. Thank you very much. And I want to thank all of my speakers today. Uh, I think it's really important the work that you're doing to, as Bhavana says, focus a spotlight on what needs to be done to remove gender inequities, because we know that that's something that um, benefits whole communities and whole societies. So thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, you can watch this and our other interview crunches on our website, that's gainhealth.org. Do follow us on social media as well. Uh, but for the moment, have a very good day. Bye.